live just as we speak. Um, good morning, good afternoon. So I'll just launch the session. I'm Adriana Salazar, Program Officer for Water and the SDGs at the French Water Partnership. Uh, welcome to today's session on blended finance for water and climate when theory meets practice. Uh, before we start, before we uh, go, get into the program, I'd just like to share a couple of very quick uh, logistical points. Um, as a reminder, the chat on Zoom is disabled. Um, so uh, please, uh, the only chat that will remain active throughout the session Session. If you've been participating to sessions throughout the week, you'll know this is the chat on Pathable, so feel free to keep both windows open. Um, so Mr. Franz Rojas, who's Water Coordinator at the Development, Development Bank of Latin America, who will be our moderator, our Master of Ceremonies, if you will, today, uh, will give us an overview of the session structure just momentarily, uh, but just a couple of comments. When we move to the breakout room, so as you know, this will be uh, the way that we've structured part two of the session, which will be the most, the more, let's say, interactive part of the session. Uh, I'd just like to, to give you already just a couple of pointers. Um, uh, note that you'll be able to choose between three options. Uh, we'll try, we'll do our best to respect uh, your choice, but please note that we'd like to make sure that each of the breakout groups has more or less uh, the same uh, number of participants. So apologies in advance if you find that you've been reallocated, but we'll rest assured we'll do, do our best to respect um, your selection. Um, in, this, in the breakout groups as well, you'll be able to uh, unmute yourselves, raise your hand, etc. Uh, but we'll touch base on this uh, later on. Uh, just also so everyone is aware, uh, since the session will close automatically two minutes after the official end of the session, we'll be quite uh, strict with timekeeping. Um, but uh, yeah, without further ado, I'd like to pass the floor uh, to Marie-Laure Vercamp, who's Director General of the French Water Partnership and who will deliver, just to get the session started, uh, some brief welcoming remarks. So Marie-Laure, you can go ahead. Thank you, Adriana. Good afternoon and uh, good morning to some and welcome all. I am Marie-Laure Vercan, the Director General of the French Water Partnership, a multi-stakeholder platform bringing together um, approximately 200 public and private French water actors active at the international level. Our members work together across four core areas, water and the SDGs, water and climate change, freshwater, biodiversity and nature-based solutions, and wash in crisis and fragility contexts. This multi-stakeholder and cross-cutting approach to water governance and management is therefore at the heart of the French Water Partnership. It is in the same spirit that we, together with a group of co-conveners that you will hear from today, have aimed to approach the topic of scaling up blended finance for water-related investments in a context where we are severely off track to achieve SDG 6 and where climate change poses a serious global threat. We know this well, public resources alone will not suffice to meet the investment gap required to achieve SDG 6 and the Paris Agreement. Definitions of blended finance may vary in scope, but they and the international consensus all point in the same direction. By mobilizing private capital in emerging and frontier markets where public sector funds are limited, blended finance is emerging as an important solution to accelerate action for water-related investments, but it has failed so far to reach scale. Through today's session, we hope to shed some light on the potential of blended finance for water-related investments to reflect on lessons learned and, especially, to brainstorm on how to overcome come, uh, bar barriers to scale blended finance. I look forward um, to today's discussions um, and take this opportunity to thank all of you and all of our speakers and co-conveners, as well as Mr. Rojas, Water Coordinator at the World Development, at the Development Bank of Latin America, and coordinator of the World Water Council Task Force on financing water for all. Today, he will act as our master of ceremonies and moderator. Thank you, Franz. Thank you very much, Marie Laure. It's a really pleasure to, to be here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, uh, I will be the, the moderator of, of this session. So I'm coming from CAF, the Development Bank of Latin America, as marie Lor has said, and also chairing the Task Force on Financing as part of the World Water Council. Um, this uh, session is convened by many institutions, as marie Lor has mentioned, and we are very glad to be here to discuss on an important issue such as blended finance. Uh, this session, in this session, we are going to have three blocks mainly. 
an introduction to blended finance in the water sector, uh, followed by three interesting case studies. And then we will have uh, three breakout groups to deepen on blended finance. So please, since now, take note to choose the group of your preference. In, in, in the right time, we are going to, to open to these three groups. The first one will discuss on policy and regulatory considerations about blended finance. The second one will deal on capacity building, knowledge, and stakeholder coordination, of course, in the same umbrella of blended finance. And the third group will have a prospective approach, I would say, uh, to discuss the way forward to improve investment conditions. Then we will be back to the plenary to listen to the reporters of each of the three groups. And finally, we will have a quick wrap up and concluding remarks. So now let, let us start with our first speaker. This is Kathleen Dominic. She is the program lead on financing water from the OECD to give us an introduction to blended finance for water related investments. Kathleen conducted an interesting publication on selected blended finance case studies in 2019. So we are very glad to have her in, in this session. So Kathleen, please go ahead. You have five, five minutes for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Franz, and hello to everyone. Greetings. Uh, it's really exciting to be here and continue this discussion. Um, my task is to, in a very, very uh, short span of time, just give you a little bit of an introduction here. So let me just start with um, the OECD definition for blended finance, which is the strategic use of development finance uh, to mobilize additional finance, usually commercial finance, towards sustainable development in developing countries. Adriana, if you click again, it will show us the graphic of uh, the range of instruments and mechanisms can be used. Blended finance is applied as a structuring instrument to achieve one of two objectives, to reduce risk related to a given investment relative to expected return or enhance expected return of an investment relative to its risk. In practice, most blended finance transactions are oriented towards de-risking and these risks are very heterogeneous in nature and vary in salience, depending on the country context and the specific investment. And I'm gonna come back to that point at the end. Could we go to the next slide? All right, just to show a bit of data, if you click again, it will show us the key messages that I wanna take away. Just two points here. OECD tracks data on the mobilization of commercial finance by development. Finance And what we see in a breakdown by sectors is that the water sector really mobilizes a very, very small share of that commercial finance, around 1%, more or less, over the period that we've been tra tracking this survey, survey data. So really, compared to other sectors, the water sector is, is, is um, very, very far from scale, minor, minor amount. Then just quickly in terms of instruments, I won't go into detail because we don't have time, but we do see that direct investment in companies and special purpose vehicles, as well as guarantees uh, are typical instruments that we see often used in the water sector. And that was reiterated in the OECD publication that we put out in 2019. Could we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so if you just click through to get the three bullets. Yeah, thanks, perfect. Oops, there we go. So I just want to highlight here, I won't read through all of this, but this is a couple of findings from the different subsectors we looked at. So we're not interested only in wash utilities. We also want to look at where blended finance could be relevant for off-scale or small-scale off-grid sanitation. There you have really different conditions in terms of maturity of the sector, in terms of regulatory framework, and so on and so forth. And then also for multi-purpose infrastructure and landscape-based approaches. And what we saw just the takeaway here is that you see a very different investment context. You see different risk return profiles. You see different barriers to mobilizing commercial capital. So that might require matching with different blended finance approaches. There is more detail in that in the, in the report if anybody's interested in that. Can we move to the next slide? And this is really the last point. And this brings us up to date really on uh, the most recent work that we've been pursuing on blender finance. So building on the publication from 2019, jointly with the World Bank, the OECD has been pursuing work to um, develop a set of indicators that help to diagnose the enabling environment for blended finance. We call this readiness for blending. So what are the indicators we have to look at to understand the strengths and weaknesses? 
for water specific policies, which influence the investment profile, but also for financial markets and capital markets in given countries. Where do we target blend of finance? In which context for which types of investments would, that, would they be appropriate? So this work is looking at a set of indicators across three main themes, um, liquidity, which is looking at the availability of, of capital in the amount, denomination, duration, and cost necessary. Uh, bankability re refers to the availability of projects that could be financed on market terms. And capacity refers to institutional regulatory policy market, human capacity requirements to make those investments happen. This work is ongoing. I just wanted to flag it to you because we think this is an exciting development that can help drive more practical action on the ground. And so you can look for a, a working paper to come out in the next uh, couple of months on this um, from, from Alex Money from Oxford. And so anyway, I'll wrap up there. I look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Indeed, the enabling environment is a requisite to boost the blended finance. So we are very, we are expecting your, your, your publication after you deal, dealing with that. So now let's continue with our case studies. Uh, the presenters will share selected case studies uh, showcasing the application and potential of blended finance for water-related investments project pilots, partnerships, etc. So cases were selected trying to be regionally diverse and including developing economies to address various types of water-related investments, nature-based solutions, water and sanitation technologies and others, and to highlight what has worked, needs, obstacles, and lessons learned to discuss on potential for replicability and scaling up. So now we are going to have three presentations. Each presentation will last approximately 10 minutes. So let, let us start with the case study on blended finance in water and sanitation sector. The key lessons learned from two project implementation. The presentation will be by Clement Frenot, the task team leader of the French Development Agency. So please go ahead, Clement. Thank you. Thank you, Franz. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, uh, this presentation uh, will be on two um, pilot projects uh, implemented by, by AFD. Uh, maybe you don't know AFD, so next slide, please. Yeah, just a few words on, on AFD. It's the Fran um, Agence Française de Développement. It's uh, the French International uh, Development Bank uh, committed for uh, of last uh, 17 five years to improve uh, everyday life, both in developing and emerging uh, countries. Uh, we have also in the group AFD uh, a private sector subsidiary, uh, who, which is called uh, Proparco, and we have rec recently integrated also the previous uh, technical cooperation um, institution that is called Expertise France. We are uh, working in 115 countries of intervention. We have uh, 85 agency and we have support. Um, uh, we are supporting uh, 4,000 projects. In 2020, uh, we have committed about uh, 12.1 billion uh, of which uh, it's closed 1 billion for water and sanitation sector. Next slide. So the first project, uh, it's in Morocco. It's called the Blue uh, Credit Line. Uh, he was implemented, he's uh, implemented because it's a project ongoing with the AFD, the European Development um, Investment Bank, and also the Bank of Africa, uh, uh, Morocco uh, Bank. Few words on the background. First, uh, the water resources uh, in Morocco is facing uh, water stress, both in quality and quantity. And also uh, stressing on the water demand uh, is, is increasing every year, uh, plus uh, 3.5 uh, since 2011. And Morocco is also uh, under uh, uh, water stress under uh, climate change. Uh, since a long time, the water sector governance has two uh, water hacked in 1995 and 2016, where the principle of polluter payer was established. Uh, and there, 
recently there is a strong willingness of the government of Morocco to enforce uh, the Water Act and notably um, on industrial uh, depollution and water reuse. The counterpart of this project is, as I mentioned, uh, the Bank of Africa. It's a major banking group in Morocco uh, and in Africa also. Uh, it's a commercial bank with a, an ambitious social responsibility uh, approach. Uh, this bank has also long experience with uh, AFD uh, on another sector, on energy sector, uh, managing uh, credit lines uh, uh, and also managing credit lines from other lenders. And uh, finally, there is a strong will of the bank to engage in financing projects in the water sector. Next slide. So the structure of this uh, project, uh, I divided in two parts. Uh, the first part, it's the, the financing part. And the second one, it's more uh, on grants, the technical assistance uh, to the bank and to the uh, sectorial uh, actor. So for the first part, there is two concessional loans uh, to the Bank of Africa. One from uh, the European Investment Bank of 10 million, million euros, and one from the French Development Agency. These uh, concessional loans um, are disbursed based on uh, eligibility criteria in order to be uh, respected. Uh, for example, there is wastewater collection project, treatment, reuse uh, on industrial or for utilities, uh, public utilities, I mean, and also project regarding water efficiency, non revenue uh, water investment. Uh, the loan for the final investor are interesting, um, has interesting financial condition uh, as it is a granted loans. So uh, the interest rate, for example, is quite low. Uh, and there is also cashback incentive. For the second part, the, there is it's more on supporting and incentivizing. There is two technical assistance, one for the bank, one for uh, the government of Morocco. Uh, the first one is financed by AFD, uh, and it's dedicated to um, uh, prepare a marketing strategy for the bank dedicated to water, uh, water and sanitation sector, select uh, the project respecting also the eligibility criteria, and also train the bank officer, loan officer uh, concerning the, wa the water supply sector. Uh, the second um, technical assistance uh, is, is financed by the European Investment Bank, and it's dedicated for the government of Morocco and also the borrower in order to prepare feasibility studies and, and also to support uh, the enforcement of regulation and monitoring uh, on water withdrawal and wastewater discharge. Next slide. The second project uh, is in a totally different environment. It's in Cambodia, in Asia. Uh, he is closed now. Uh, he was uh, financed by AFD, the World Bank, the European um, Union, and uh, the counterpart is the Foreign Trade Bank, uh, a national bank, uh, Cambodian National Bank. Few words on the background. Uh, in Cambodia, it's quite specific. There is a spontaneous and dynamic private sector, both in water supply and electricity sector, that have invest. Uh, since long time and three, three decades uh, through a bankable project. All of the projects uh, are bankable. Uh, unfortunately, there is a limited access to, uh, to finance for these private entrepreneurs due to uh, the maladaptation of financial products uh, in order to finance infrastructure uh, in terms of interest rates uh, are, were too high, collateral required are high also, maturity of, uh, of the loan are inadapted, and the evaluation condition uh, could be uh, improved. The third point on the, this background, uh, there was a weak structuration of the private uh, ecosystems. I mean, uh, consulting firm, construction company, etc., cetera, where uh, a to there was a total absence of consulting firm in, in order to ensure proper design, uh, infrastructure con construction and business plan. Few words on the counterpart, the foreign trade bank. Uh, there was also a strong will uh, of the bank to engage, uh, engage uh, financing in uh, electricity and water supply sector. And also one of specific uh, things, a strong willingness to employ other methods of project evaluation from mortgage-based lending to more uh, cash flow-based uh, lending. Next slide. Uh, as a result, uh, so, 
a few uh, description uh, and results of this project. The um, uh, financial structure was composed by a, a concessional loan of 15 million uh, US dollar uh, credit line um, to the, the foreign trade bank. And also it's specific of this project. Uh, it was not the case in Morocco case. It, it's a risk sharing guarantee of 5 million uh, for individual or on, on the portfolio. Uh, few results, uh, as I, uh, I can highlight, uh, it's before the situation, before and, and after the project, uh, just on the financial product, before the interest rate uh, was between 12 to 14. Uh, after the, the implementation of this project, the interest rate is more close six to, uh, to eight. The maturity of the loan before was uh, limited at five years. Uh, it's a big a problem for uh, private, uh, private investments in water supply uh, due to the long-term investment. And after the project, it's 10 years. The collateral use were before only mortgage. Uh, I mean, land and house. And after the project, the bank was uh, managed to use mortgage, but also water supply asset value and also the NPV in order to assess uh, the risk of the project. The grace period was improved also from six months to one year. And the loan application uh, requirement before no requirement for the loan application and after there was business plan with asset valuation and NPV calculation. Uh, the debasement method uh, also upfront before and after it was based on an accredited consulting company. In order to support this financial structure, there was three kind of grant. Uh, it's a mix of uh, funding from European Union, uh, World Bank and AFD. Uh, so the first grant, uh, it's dedicated to the bank, uh, same as Morocco case, uh, in order to support the bank uh, in terms of analysis of the project, uh, reinforce the skills of loan officer on commercial and technical skills, and also on marketing and communication of the credit line. The second TA, uh, financed by EU and, um, and the World Bank, it's in order to support the technical assistance to the borrower for dedicate to the private entrepreneurs in order to prepare uh, business plans, bank transaction, and ensure technical studies and construction work supervision. And the last one, it's more for social measure uh, as water supply, it's a social sector also. Uh, it's to subsidize and encourage a water operator to uh, reduce the cost for uh, poor household. Next slide. Based, yeah, next slide. Next slide. Yes, thanks. Um, so based on the comparison of these two uh, projects, uh, what are finally the case success factor that we have learned from the implementation of these two projects? The first thing, it's the changing environment uh, that creates new rules. In Morocco, there was a changing environment. Uh, the government would like to enforce the Water Act uh, in climate change environment. And for Cambodia, there was important on change on uh, water tariff policy, water laws, licensing projects during the, the project implementation. Second case success factor, it's the alignment of actors and donors. In Morocco case, there was an alignment of uh, European Investment Bank, AFD, and Bank of Africa on the purpose and the objective of the credit line. And in Cambodia also, there, there was an historical historical coordination among World Bank, AFD, and EU on a similar roadmap. Uh, the third case success factor, it's the financial vehicle. Uh, I, am, I am pretty sure that we will discuss uh, on this project after on that. Uh, the financial vehicle is crucial in Morocco. There, was the, there is the Bank of Africa uh, that have a strong will and would like to implement this project. And in Cambodia, there was also a strong mo motivation uh, from the top management of the FTB Bank. And the last case success factor, it's the structuration of the technical assistance in two parts for the bank and for the sectorial actors uh, in both projects. Next slide. Based on, on these two projects, what 
uh, what are the, the lessons learned? Uh, the first uh, blended finance projects are uh, complex uh, in to be prepared and also during the implementation, but have uh, a strong impact. The first lesson, it's project preparation uh, using blended finance approach takes time. Uh, just an example, in order to prepare the project in Cambodia, the, the time preparation is close to uh, four to five years. Uh, it takes time to identify the proper financial uh, vehicles, as I said, and also to design properly the, the project support uh, TA. The second lesson, it's the risking, it's not only guarantee. Guarantee is necessary in, in a plenty of cases, but technical assistance ensure also a role to de risk the investment. And this is essential for financial institution and also for sectorial uh, uh, actors. The lesson three, it's the complexity of the implementation uh, that generate a lot of transaction costs. As you can see, most of time that in finance, it's small investments in the case of Cambodia and, and in the case in Morocco, it's small infrastructure that generates small, small loan size that generates a lot of transaction cost. And this is uh, the key point in order to uh, scanning up this project, how to uh, create and standardize uh, at the most as possible the, the loan process application, and also how to use intermediary national actors uh, as a business broker accredited in order to ensure confidence between the borrower and the lenders. And uh, the last lesson uh, is that blended finance also uh, can drastically improve private sector ecosystems by reducing entry barriers on access to finance, on technical studies and on business plans, um, by creating new market and new opportunities also, and also uh, by creating clear capacity uh, building strategy for uh, search actor are essential. Thank you very much. I hope uh, it it's only in 10 minutes. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Clement. Yeah. Uh, you know, we are a little bit delayed, but uh, uh, we have heard and learned on two interesting case studies. Uh, what was interested is to, to, to see that in Morocco and also in, in Cambodia case, we've seen that some concessional loans coming from IFIs were also supported by technical assistance and which is important to, to stress is on the, in the Cambodian cases that the technical assistance went not only to the supply side, but also on the demand side. I would see the, the lender and also the borrower. So I think it's very interesting. And of course, the four lessons learned. Now let's go to the second case study about leveraging uh, blended finance to scale up WASH social business. Uh, it's a joint case study, but by 1001 Fontaines and Safi Sana. So we have a participation of Mr. Julian Ansel, the CEO of 1000 Fontaines, and also Mr. Art van der Beukel, uh, CEO and founder of Safiana. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Just to mention, we're a couple of minutes delayed, so I would encourage you to try to keep it at around 10 minutes. So go ahead, the floor is yours. Yeah, so <clears throat> Julian and I decided to do something together. Uh, we like each other and we have a business that uh, has a lot of similarities and I think it makes sense to try to explain uh, the blended finance principles from the angle of, uh, of both wastewater, what we do and what uh, Thousand One from Ten does uh, on water, drinking water. So uh, next slide please. Yeah, but oh, perhaps before I start, it's good to mention that there is the possible uh, the chat. So if there's any questions or suggestions or whatever, please state them in the, uh, in, in the, in the chat and we can discuss, uh, respond to that later after the presentation. Okay, so like I said, Hesavisana and 1001 from 10, we are both uh, social enterprises and we operate in a slightly different market, but we have some interesting similarities. And uh, we met each other a few years ago and then we also realized that these, in, these, these issues are also uh, have an impact on the, how you finance your business. And so on the one hand, uh, the SDG challenges, we both, operate uh, on the basis of an innovative uh, market-based approach. Uh, secondly, we operate in a market that has very little uh, infrastructure, uh, little knowledge, but also lack of public investment uh, that is needed to, to make these uh, infrastructures. And last is we both serve the, uh, the bottom of the period. 
pyramid. And so, but let me let me start with the Savasana model very brief, uh, how we operate, what we do. So basically, we started about 10 years ago uh, because the, the problems of fecal sludge management are significant and especially uh, not just in the collection, but also in the treatment part. So that's where we, uh, where we operate. So we started the plan that you see here on the picture is based in, uh, in a slum close to Accra with about 300,000 people. And uh, so the model is about, yeah, so the, 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 the treatment of fecal sludge, about 95% in, uh, in Ghana is not treated. So it ends up in the open sewer or in the ocean. Uh, so it's a huge problem. So the, the business model that we have looked at uh, 10 years ago and which is now implemented on a commercial scale is to, to source fecal sludge in combination with organic waste and to, to basically uh, recycle the waste and produce a, a biofertilizer and uh, electricity through a, a combined heat power generation. So we sell the electricity to the grid and we sell the compost in the market. And the income from these uh, from these streams from these products uh, are enough to cover your operational cost. But I'll show you a bit on, about that later. Um, yeah, I think and, and and how we want to scale further, of course, with the blended finance uh, concept in mind, to use build, operate, and transfer uh, contracts uh, and offer uh, our services to the public, to the government, but also industries. Yeah, so Julien, I think you can say a bit about uh, Thousand Mom Fontaine, about your business model. Yes, thank you very much, Hart. So what you see, the picture you see on the right is what we call a water kiosk. So we have about 300 of them in, in Cambodia, and we are talking about um, small water treatment stations, and we are focusing to provide safe, small remote communities with safe drinking water. So um, uh, we empower local entrepreneurs to manage uh, those uh, facilities and manage it like a business with an economic model behind. So they deliver 20 bottle jugs that guarantees a quality of water uh, at the point of use and it, this water is delivered at home so in a radius of about 10 kilometers to cover the last uh, mile for a price below two cents per liter which is affordable for this uh, bottom of pyramid population so we have a franchise model uh, which basically ensures business continuity and financial sustainability so for example our staff provide to the entrepreneurs uh, monthly water analysis uh, maintenance of the site continue sales and financial coaching. So in exchange of those services, we collect 20% of our franchise's revenue, sort of a service fee, which enables to cover our cost and make it a sustainable business. So uh, today we impact 900,000 people in Cambodia. We are the largest uh, safe drinking water producer in rural Cambodia, 25% of the territory. We've reached uh, break even last year. And our ambition is to cover by 2025, 100% uh, of communes, rural communes of 10,000 inhabitants. And you go over to you, Hart. Yeah, so next slide, please, Adriana. Um, so here is about, this is about break even achieved and then what, and then how, you do, how do you scale? So you have to see this slide from left to right. So first of all, of course, uh, proving your concept, uh, which starts, well, in, in, let me start with the OPEX. So the first ambition we both had is to be self-financed uh, through your sale of products, uh, water or the byproducts that Savasana is producing. Uh, that, I mean, without that, there is no, basically no basis for, uh, for scaling anything. And, and, and for us, uh, like Julian said, they reached their break even last year. We are not there yet. We, we hope to do that this year. Um, but that's a very important milestone to reach to go further. Um, the CAPEX, looking at your initial investments, uh, in both cases was subsidized. Uh, and that's, of course, a, a, yeah, something that is, is great yeah, if, if you can do it in the beginning stages. But of course, in order to scale, you need to go beyond that. And I think that that's, that, let's say, the middle part of this, of this slide. Uh, you have to, to shift your economic model. Yeah, so if you look at this, these graphics, they, they have a very similar approach. Yeah, so let's say the total cost of your operation, uh, your, your, in, your investment, but also the capital cost is, let's say, one block on the left. And that has to be covered by something that is, well, in the case of OPEX, coming from the, the returns of your, of your products that you're selling. And the CAPEX, um, what was a grant, uh, is, is, is the ambition to have that as a blended finance mechanism. Uh, in our case, it's about grants plus a loan that can be covered by a public service fee, which is like a fee that is paid per, per ton of treated waste. And um, uh, for, for, for 1,000 one from 10, that's the combination of sale of water and, and also the grants and loans. Um, 
Yeah, I think so here you see also these figures of 10 million and 7 million. These are the CAPEX investments that we require to develop a new program. And so for us, that's 10 million, for Thousand Mount Fontaine, it's 7 million. And um, with, with these, with these uh, investments, we can, uh, we can actually leverage that and create much bigger impact. Um, so we expect to be, be there in 2025 with, with about uh, 500,000 people. And um, so as you can see then, um, with that in place, we are able to, to create more like an enhanced sustainability. And so you are less dependent on tenders, for example, and create your own, your own program. Um, yeah, and, and unlock opportunities, of course, that's important. So just a bit of insight from our end, we, uh, we are now looking in Ghana to further expand. So like I said, we have the plant in, in Accra. We are looking into other uh, towns in, uh, in, um, in Ghana, but also in Mali. We are conducting a feasibility study to, to see whether we can work with a local utility to combine the Savisana concept with uh, a wastewater treatment plant. And uh, from uh, Thousand Mount Fontaine, it's the ambition to scale further in Cambodia. Um, yeah, I think it's good to give the floor to Julien because I think another, this is not just going like this. We've been doing this for 10 years. It's quite complex. So I think it's interesting to share like what are the lessons learned and, and some of the criteria that we think are in place to, to actually do this. Uh, thank you. So, so, thank you. Or, or... so moving to next slide. So uh, indeed, as part of our new business plan, we, are look, we, are, we started the fundraising uh, last year. So we are looking for $7 million to, to double our impact. Uh, and basically the way we structured it was for a blend of grant and loans. Okay, But we are looking for very concessional loans. So with a very, I would say, limited return uh, because of our business model and our willingness to maintain the social impact for our, for our customers. So it was very hard to find the right uh, investors because we, we didn't fill any box. And how one of our partners says we were really suffering from the so-called death valley effect because we were too big to be fully supported by ground and too small to enter into the impact investing expectation so it was hard the way we approach that that we we define and we so we had to rework our business case and and worked with a top tier french institutional bank uh, a specific business plan to have them support us so we work so we 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 worked hard to define the right terms in terms of uh, rate um, below two percent Race period, absence of guarantee, etc. So we managed to demonstrate them that the social impact we were created could justify some preferred uh, financial terms for us, and that basically uh, gave the evidence to other partners that if such a bank basically endorses us, we could uh, uh, we could support. So that's how it created, I would say, a virtuous circle, and we mobilized other historical partners that understood the hybrid model to de-risk the investment and therefore open doors. So uh, basically, we are very confident now in our ability to secure that, but it was a long a journey and we had to sort of manage by ourselves. Uh, so strategically, we see that as a means also, and not only to support our own growth, but to convince governments uh, and the and development agency to amplify the long-term support to our uh, system. Uh, but obviously uh, we cannot do that alone. And that's one of the message we have with heart is we need support, we need the sector to structure and we need to create collectively the right enabling environment uh, uh, to, to have the good uh, coalition of investor and, and lending condition to fit with those uh, hybrid models. So we'll have the opportunity to debate that um, in a specific session uh, later on. So I'll uh, see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to Julian and Art for sharing these two interesting projects with a lot of potential. Uh, we have learned on, on a case of a circular economy and it was interesting to know that even in, in small communities, part of the revenue is coming from uh, the selling of byproducts. And in the other case, water kiosk, which is very usual in, in some countries in, in Asia and also in Africa uh, for off-grid solutions. So thank you very much for sharing these two cases. Now let's go to the last, but not least the case study on blended finance for nature-based solutions to achieve water security the case of Cape Town, a well-known city about the day zero. And uh, we are gonna have our presentation by Mrs. Louise Stafford. She is the African program director of TNC in South Africa. So please go ahead, Louise. Thank you and excited to be here today. And thanks for those of you who dialed into this uh, session. So since the... Um, 
first water fund was launched in Kitu in 2000. Over 43 other water funds were established in 13 countries using, using a range of uh, funding models. I'm going to focus today on one of those, which is the Greater Cape Town Water Fund. But before I jump in, I'm going to give you a quick background on the, on the Greater Cape Town Water Fund. Next slide. So as, uh, as we, it's quite well known that uh, in 2018, Cape Town faced a crisis. Uh, the uh, cities and the region's water was about to run out. Over 4 million uh, residents would have to queue every day for seven gallons of water, their daily supply. And this was, would potentially be very uh, disruptive to the economy and to the social fiber of Cape Town. Next slide. While this situation was playing itself out, the source water areas upon which the region depends for its water is, was invaded by alien trees. And these alien trees are using up to 20% more water than the native vegetation. And there were significant efforts over multiple years to get the problem under control. But despite all the efforts, the problem became worse. And especially because it is very high up in the mountainous areas and remote. And uh, the, the, the reason for the failure had multiple uh, origins. Next slide. And I'm just going to look at one of them, which is fine funding, and let's talk a bit about it. Uh, the, they were, the, I mentioned the efforts to get the problem under control, but there was a reliance on government to do the work. Uh, there was also inconsistency in funding, insufficient funding, and there wasn't a clear benefit of who benefits and why would, why would they be a, a, a benefit in investing in um, uh, nature-based solutions, in this case, clearing invasive trees to uh, get more water in the system. And there was also a stop start because of a bureaucracy and all these factors contributed to a situation where the problem got worse. Uh, and this is in a region that had, uh, that, that uh, the predictions are that the water demand will outstrip the supply in 2020, and we are in 2020. Next slide. So a new approach was needed. Um, and the, 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 the calculations that we made for the business case showed that 55 billion liters of water is lost every year as a result of the alien trees in the uh, invasions in the catchment. And if nothing is done, the water losses will double in 20 years. The current water losses of 55 billion liters of water equates to two months water supply for Cape Town. And if we think back to the day zero, this could push a potential future day zero back with two months. Next slide. So we're focusing on seven priority areas, uh, subcatchments in the watersheds where we if we invest in those areas, we can reclaim the two months water uh, losses for Cape Town. Next slide. In 2018, the Greater Cape Town Water Fund business case was launched and we ranked the seven priority subcatchments in order of importance for water and the, the low hanging fruit where we could get the quickest return on investment. This showed that Investing in nature is a cost-effective, no regrets option for addressing the water security challenges. As I mentioned, Cape Town was predicted to run out of water by 2021. So the city of Cape Town with the utility started looking at different options um, to augment the water uh, supply to avoid a day where the demand would outstrip the supply. Next slide. And of the options that the city uh, considered was desalination, water reuse, and groundwater exploration. And we also compared investing in nature with the other options. 
And it showed that nature-based solutions is not only the cheapest option, but also has additional benefits such as job creation, restoring biodiversity, and uh, reducing the negative impact of wildfires. While during the, uh, the, the uh, summer, the long summer seasons, uh, the water availability increased by 24%. Next slide. So the Greater Cape Town Waterfront has a lifespan in a, of a long of a 30 years, and $48 million is needed for the full cost implementation of the 30-year program of the Greater Cape Town Waterfront. And if you look at the blue bars, it, it represents the first six years, because time is not on our side. We need to change the uh, the situation where the water gains, uh, the losses can be turned into gains. And we looked at different scenarios and it showed through the different scenarios that we looked at that the most um, uh, realistic is a six year period. And we call that the uh, six year high impact phase. So if we do that upfront investment, maintain the, the, uh, uh, the areas, the 54 and a half thousand hectares, of the seven priority subcatchment free of invasive trees, the water benefits will accrue over time, and that is represented by the dotted line where the cost um, is reduced as long as the areas that were cleared are maintained. Next slide. So then we also uh, looked at the if, if we consider the initial clearing of the invasive trees in the catchments, the follow-up and the maintenance, the program cost of uh, uh, running such a program, including the wa raw water treatment over the 30 year period of uh, in full implementation, the avoided desalination operational cost is an estimated return of 351% if one invests in nature. And the value at that stage was uh, when we did this calculation was uh, based on a nine rand per uh, a thousand liters. Next slide. So with this information, we then approached uh, the potential donors to look at the, what would be the best funding model. And we considered different options. Next slide. So the, the, we developed a, a sustainable funding mod, uh, a strategy, and the strategy is based on a decision support system that consists of three components. A scenario modeler that looks at the benefits and the cost under different funding assumptions, and no, no uh, in, uh, 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 business as usual, which was before the water fund, uh, at where one only uh, 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 relies on one funding source and that long-term full implementation. The financial model incorporates the program management costs, the benefits monetization to arrive at the full cycle return on investment of the 30 years, and then an online platform. And that uh, the link is at the bottom and I encourage you to, to go to that link. It's open source and it, it helps uh, track the implementation and reporting on the benefits. And for that purpose, the seven priority subcatchments were divided into hydrological management units. And uh, the, the cost is then based on, on the clearing of those um, hydrological monit uh, monitoring units, uh, management units, and uh, the water benefits is tracked over time. Next slide. We also looked at who benefits from uh, uh, investing or from clearing the, the, the catchments. And we looked at two uh, uh, options or two uh, uh, scenarios. The one is avoided yield reduction by dam. And we also looked at avoided yield reduction by users. The city of Cape Town is by far the largest uh, water user but the city share, it's not the only water user. It shares its water in through a very uh, complex uh, water supply system called the Western Cape Water Supply System with agriculture, other urban users, and in the in those industries. Next slide. This is the, the Greater Cape Town Water Fund sustainable, uh, uh, sustainable funding strategy that looks at 
where will the funding come from for this uh, full implementation? The, in South Africa, the national government is the custodian of uh, water sources, water resources. So the national government is very important. We also have a provincial government that has an ecological infrastructure investment framework. The uh, Trans Caledon uh, uh, agency who's building the dams, there's an option of infrastructure charge. And then the, the, the beneficiaries who are municipalities, the agricultural sector and the private sector, there's different options from uh, getting the investment from those downstream beneficiaries into the, the upstream restoration. And the Greater Cape Town Water Fund, to sustain it in the long term, we need to raise an endowment for that operational cost for coordinating the science, monitoring, evaluation, and stakeholder engagement, which are ongoing through the lifespan of a water fund. So, uh, next slide. Just to let you know, Louise, we're exactly at around the 10 minute mark. Okay, we are now in the six year uh, uh, funding cycle. Um, and the first three years were um, funded mostly by uh, the private sector. And the city of Cape Town has a new water strategy and they bought into the uh, water fund. And the city of Cape Town provided 50 million, uh, uh, 62 million rand or uh, 4.2 million dollar over three year period to invest in the water fund. And another, uh, uh, municipality also now came on board one of the smaller users but they get a significant amount of water and they are also now going to uh, use water tariffs to invest in uh, up, upstream restoration so the funding that the city of cape town provided was catalytic in bringing other uh, unlocking other funding as we can see from the west uh, the west coast district municipality next slide so we in the six year uh, funding cycle or the six year high impact phase and the funding gap is uh, $13 million. Next slide. And we using a blend of public, private uh, and government sector downstream uh, uh, includes uh, water users, uh, it includes uh, industries who's dependent on water and the, the municipalities. And uh, as the uh, program matures, the, the, the proportionary or the, the portion that each of these um, sectors will contribute will change. But we envisage this to, uh, for the lifespan of the Greater Cape Town Water Fund to be uh, a blend of private and public sector funding. Thank, uh, next slide. Thank you. And there's my contact details uh, if, if you're interested to reach out. Thanks. Thank you very much, Luis, as, as Adriana said. And, and, and thank you, Adriana, for your support on, about time, because I think we are a little bit late. So we're going to, to gain time in, in this next session. And thank you, Luis, for sharing this, this case about the water funds, which is uh, well known in Latin America with the different cases in, in Ecuador, in Brazil and, and others. And uh, it was interesting to see the annual avoided yield losses graph you have shared and also the funding model strategy. So now we have our third part of the session uh, with the breakout rooms. Uh, the audience has three options. So we will do our best to respect your choice, trying to, to, to have uh, the same amount of, of uh, people in, in the three groups. The first group is on scaling budget finance and strengthening the enabling environment, as I said, re related to policy and regulatory considerations. The moderator is Almota Sabadi, a managing director of UFM Water. And the reporter is Ms. Chris Sebering, coordinator of international waters at GEF, the Global Environment Facility. Uh, our second group, is about capacity building, knowledge, and stakeholder coordination and mobilization. The moderator is Mr. Julian Ansel, CEO of 1001 Fontaines, and the rapporteur, Mr. Bukes Michaud, managing partner of Waterpreneurs. And the third group is going to be managed by um, <clears throat> about, uh, sorry, the way forward to improve investment conditions and attract more commercial finance. 
the moderator is Mr. Chris Club, the managing director of Convergence Blended Finance, and the reporter is Kathleen Dominique, the lead of financing water of OECD. We have around 22 to 25 minutes for this activity, and we will try to let you know a minute if it's possible before it ends, uh, just to, to have a wrap up in, in any case. And once we are back in the plenary, each reporter will have around three minutes each to summarize the main conclusions, outcomes, calls to actions or recommendation on their respective breakup group. So now um, uh, let's go to, to into these uh, three breakout groups, please. And then we'll be back with the three reporters. Thank you. Thank you very much, Franz. So if I can just perhaps liaise uh, orally with, uh, um, with my colleague, uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Okay, there we go. So I see that the, that the groups are launched. Camelia, can you hear me? Yes, hello, the groups, the groups are launched. So now everybody can join uh, one of the okay. three rooms. So it'll just take a couple of minutes to transition, but we can see that people are starting to join the groups and then manually we'll just rebalance them slightly if needed. But as, <laughs> many, as Franz has mentioned, of course, trying to respect uh, your selection as far as, as much as possible. So people are starting to flow into the groups around 60, 50, 40 to go. We're getting there. The so, three are going to be very interesting. So that's why I'm going to jump in from one to another. But just me, <laughs> please stay in your group. Exactly. So participants, just so you know, you'll be able to uh, unmute yourselves, of course, uh, during the breakout groups. You can also raise your hand um, to, to, to request the floor to interact with your moderators and rapporteurs. The groups will close automatically after 25 minutes. You'll receive a, a little pop-up message five minutes before closing to know uh, so, so that we can start wrapping up. Okay, okay so I think we're good. Uh, and as far as our moderators and rapporteurs go, I, I see that some of us are still here in the main room. Uh, you, you would have to select the, the group that you've been assigned to. So Kathleen, if you can, or if you, I'm not sure if you've done so yet, if you can uh, join the third group, the same would apply to Chris uh, Club. Chris Severin would have to join group one. I don't know if you can see this option. I can't do yeah, it. I don't well, think so. No, I don't. I, I just I can click on it. It says rename, delete room, or assign. I don't think we can do that. You don't have a join uh, join group. Uh, I don't have a join option. No, nope. that's that's the same for me, Adriana. Maybe because we're co-hosts, so we can we can move pe other people to rooms. But yeah, yeah, I can't I actually join go that. But what's going out again? I think I think somebody should invite us because I was in the breakout group and then uh, there were X. I make X. I came back here and I cannot go back now. Yeah, me too. Say, group okay. one is without any any assistance. So I see that the moderators and rapporteurs for some reason are are staying in the main room. So I'm just going to see if you as I mean as um, as co-conveners and participants you should be able to join. So I'm not quite sure why that's the case. So we're going to perhaps just ask, uh, I'm not sure. So. Okay, we are all here then. Okay. Okay. So we are back to the, to the main, plen to the plenary, right? Uh, I, I was wondering if everybody's here in the plenary. Yes, right? So now we are over time, <laughs> but uh, let us give a couple of minutes for each reporter to, to and try to, to summarize the discussion around each group. So please, uh, Chris Severin, uh, provide us with <laughs> well, some conclusion. I, or I mean, honestly, honestly, it makes little sense. I mean, there was a very rich discussion. We're talking about, I mean, the, the policy and regulatory frameworks needed for, for facilitating or for enabling uh, these, these blended finance schemes. And I think we came, came down to some kind of agreement that it, unless we have some of these policy frameworks in place, not at the same time, but fairly at the same time as we start these blended financing um, or other kind of financing, 
it's not really going to matter. We're not really going to get to anywhere sensible. We can we can build. We know that from IFIs and also bilateral aid, we can build very fine things. But if there's no policy framework along with it, if there's not, if if these investments do not give value at the lowest at the at the ground level, then they're going to fall apart. Either because of the lack of impact on the ground, or because it, there's no there's no ties to to the to the government uh, and the policy policy world. So we need to have all these things moving in some kind of uh, uh, like in a tandem tied together, but but still moving ahead. And that's why that's why we are still talking about this. Um, you know, and we have been talking about this for the last what, 45 years, 50 years. So it's not easy. It's not it's but it's not impossible. We saw it. We heard it today. It's possible to do things. But we didn't crack the knot, unfortunately. We were just scratching the surface. But thank you so much. And thank you for an excellent session, Adriana. You are incredible. Thank you very much, Chris. Now let's go to Briggs Michaud, please. Yes, session two was um, focusing on, on the role of um, uh, the capacity building, knowledge, and stakeholder coordination and mobilization. Um, and so what came out of it is that basically the, the players are ready. Um, they are structuring themselves. I mean, uh, whether they are entrepreneurs on one side, financiers on the other side. Um, what's lacking today is uh, maybe platforms in which they can come together uh, join forces, build coalitions, uh, create joint advocacy, uh, and uh, have basically entry points for conversations and discussions so that uh, they can implement together um, projects at scale. Uh, so there is still a narrative to be built uh, to, 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 to demonstrate that um, these projects can work and, uh, and, the, um, and this coalition and this stakeholder coordination uh, can support uh, this process. Thank you very much, Briggs. And now, Kathleen, please. Thank you. Well, at Group 3, we had a very good discussion. Uh, we were focused on the question of scale, scaling up. Is it possible? And if so, how could it potentially be done? Um, we looked at, uh, there were several comments around different blended finance structures or approaches that could be used to get to scale. Um, one uh, participant pointed out really the need to see how we could get uh, municipalities to access or issue bonds to access capital markets and discussing some of the problems with that, the, the difficult credit rating, the lack of credit worthiness, and, and uh, trying to discuss well, what kind of guarantees for credit enhancements could be brought to bear there. Uh, also talking about you know, barriers, high transaction costs to blended finance uh, deals and the time that they take, uh, thinking about where grants and uh, money could be used just to cover and offset some of those costs. Also talking a little bit about particular political risks, uh, including you know, related to tariffs, water rights, uh, foreign exchange, how to deal with those. But importantly on scale, maybe landing on two points, one really uh, more optimism about thinking about portfolio-based approaches to uh, bring together a range of different projects that helps to remove the project, the project level credit risks um, and, and could be more attractive to investors. Also thinking about funds of funds models as a way of, of aggregating. So I stopped there, but it was a great discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kathleen. I guess we don't have too much time just for wrapping up. Uh, let me just finish and thanking uh, the reporters and the moderators of these breakout groups. And uh, just to, in order to summarize in one more minute, I guess we have uh, blended finance can be applied as we have seen as an, a structuring instrument to reduce the perceived risk of a project or to enhance the expected return of a project. Um, furthermore, we, we would like to stress that any innovative use of capital, including blended finance, needs, needs to be combined with at least three other conditions. A supportive enabling environment, as we were discussing in, in the group one, a well-prepared projects also, uh, either if it's bankable or not, following a social impact or financial return. And the third, capacity to execute projects effectively and in regards with institutions at the rector level, regulatory level, but also at the implementing levels. So all of this to result in an improved water security. Uh, finally, I would like to stress that at the Task Force on Financing Water at, uh, of the World Water Council, we are also working on a blended finance case with a different perspective coming as trying to summarize different case studies and uh, with 
trying to identify many attributes. So we invite you to 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 look at the at this publication that we hope to to have in a couple of months more. So thank you very much to all the conveners uh, for uh, making possible this uh, session. And uh, from my side, thank you very much. I really enjoyed this session. Going back to to you, Adriana. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, so I see we've been given uh, maybe a couple, uh, yeah, a couple of extra minutes. But I, I agree. I think we can we can absolutely close the session. And yeah, just to, to thank uh, again all the speakers, co-conveners, and the participants that joined us today. Uh, and uh, if if you all agree, I think we can we can then conclude the session. So thank you all very very much for your patience and for your participation today. We hope it was useful. Uh, and of course, we hope uh, yeah uh, to 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 continue collaborating and then working with this wonderful uh, group of co-conveners that uh, we. We had with us today so thank you very much and uh and see you soon bye bye thank you, thank you very much goodbye bye thank you bye, bye. bye.